Good morning, afternoon, or evening, folks, and welcome to Cast of All Trades, the show where we talk about developing skills, exploring ideas, and following curiosity. I'm your host, Orion Siebert, and in this episode, I have the pleasure of talking to Nicole Karnowski, a professional public speaker, coach, and communications expert. Why should we care about public speaking? How can being a good communicator help you offstage? How should you be preparing for your presentations before, during, and after you present? We answer these questions and more in this interview. I had an absolutely wonderful time chatting with Nikki, and was able to learn so much personally that I hope I'll be able to apply to the podcast. And if you're interested in more tactical and actionable advice from experts like Nikki, then subscribe to the show so you don't miss out on more episodes like this. And without further ado, Nicole Kornowski. Nicole, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So lately I've been thinking about what can I do to be a better podcaster, presenter, someone who can really project his ideas better. And I was thinking, what is this skill of public speaking and presentation? And who do I know that can really lay into it, really talk about it? And uh, after talking to a couple people, you came up a couple times. And I thought to myself, yeah, Nicole would be a great person to talk to about this. So would you mind telling me a bit about your story of, well, what is it that you do and how did you start? Sure. Uh, Well, my husband and I, we own Metamorphosis Coaching, Consulting, and Training. We work with individuals and teams, really helping them to communicate better in the workplace, to work well together, to understand their unique work styles, communication styles. So that's a big part of our business. My background um, is in broadcast news. So I was in TV news, um, worked as a news producer for uh, several years, and then kind of fun full circle in the last couple years, I've um, now kind of guessed on, I I did uh, channel three for a while, just guesting. That was actually each week during the pandemic um, on spots kind of like this, you know, communication, um, coaching, different topics like that that are relevant to audiences so kind of full circle from where i started Mm -hmm. uh you know and came (laughs) back and and, and now um i do a kind of monthly segment on the lift on different topics like this so all right so why broadcasting of all things what got you into that you know i i love the i think the excitement and the adventure um of kind of being in the mix and also the ability i think to tell stories and to help people kind of you know sharing information you know with people uh i don't know that just really there's a lot to that but uh so many different aspects to that but that's what really kind of got me excited when i was in college and kind of thinking about that career path Mm -hmm. So I've known a couple different newscasters throughout the years, but I never really got to talk to most of them about what that career path was like. And I have one or two brief questions I wanted to touch on a bit before you dove a bit more into the communications, presentations, public speaking, and they do relate in some way. But uh, I've always wondered how much of it is scripted beforehand or pre-written by someone else, or is it a lot of off the cuff, like here's a few bullet points that you go off of, or... What's kind of the background behind that? Well, the producing job, which is what I did primarily, um, it's you're writing. So like for the 11 o'clock newscast that I did, that is pretty much all written out for um, the anchors, you know, and what we call the talent. Um, So it's all written out for them now you know, good talent will, will ad lib things. They'll make it natural. You know, if they have guests on, they're going to talk to guests and that's not always scripted because we're people, right? So, you know, um, kind of like now when I guest on things there, there's some bullet points and, you know, I might write roughly what I'm going to talk on and maybe have some graphics that they have up. So there's some, some kind of, you know, cohesiveness and they know where you're going, but But generally with live guests, it's a little bit more um, open and unscripted. But generally newscasts and things like that, it's scripted. It's, um, you know, written. There's only so much time. So it's it's, how can I get this story told Mm -hmm. in a short amount of time for it to make sense and get all the facts in? Interesting. So how much voice does the the newscaster have in 
like the actual writing of their script or the I guess preparation of the notes for what they're going to say? Well, you know, the talent, if they're, you know, or the anchors, if they're really opposed to something or what, you know, they do have some input and influence with that. But generally, you know, when I think about it, things I wrote, I, I, for them, I never really had much pushback. So, you know, it's, you're reporting mostly it sh- as it should be, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. we don't see that today, you know, um, but difference between news of news of actual news and news of entertainment. Yeah. So, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, in the best scenario, pure journalism, you are reporting facts, you are reporting, um, the topic, the issue, and and you shouldn't have a side. It should be done in in, in neutral. Like I'm very passionate about that. Too mm-hmm. often today, I feel like we have very partisan reporting, and that's not really what reporting is. It I would be, agree I'm, with you on that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if I'm going to cover, you know, an event or a political, I, I don't put my agenda in there. I should be like, here's what happened. Here are the facts. Here's what was discussed without an angle. That is pure journalism. But um, unfortunately, we see a lot more entertainment and opinion. Um, and really what I see is kind of um, speaking to those social media viewers and things. So it's a, a little bit of a, um, not how you're trained as a journalist, you know, it's to be objective, present facts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. But entertainment gets clicks and yes. it's hard to deny that. Yes. So moving a bit more past just the news side of things how does communication and public speaking what you do today differ from what you've done with news broadcasting in the past you know there there are links you know to things but i think um you know public speaking is something we all can benefit from i think it ranks up there um with with on people's list of scariest things it's ranked as the number one scariest thing for a majority of people even over death So yeah. there's always a funny joke that goes around where people would rather be the person in the coffin than the guy t- reading the obituary. <laughs> exactly. So that that always kind of blows my mind. But the the thing is, good public speaking and just learning to be able to share is one of those things. I think it's like 85% of our success is really linked to that ability to communicate, negotiate, and lead. And only 15% is technical. Now, when we share that, there, of course, in your business or what you do, you have to be proficient. But you know, once you're at a certain level of proficiency, the thing that will really get you, um, what I want to say, even farther in your career in life is learning those soft skills. So the good presenting, the good communication, the good listening skills. Um, these are some things people pass over, but they're so the the basics are important. Mm-hmm. I would absolutely agree with you there, and it reminds me of an interesting practice that many big tech companies used to do, like Google and Microsoft, where when they were looking for lead coders or lead technical designers of certain projects, they would actually go and find people with more soft skills-based degrees, like communications, like, uh, I guess communication is the big one that comes to mind right away for me. But they would go and find these people because it was easier to train the hard skills into them. It was easier to train them how to do coding and how to do like computer technical things than it was to try to train someone who's already like already knows the hard code and all that stuff to be a good public speaker, to be a good presenter, to be a good leader. So they would go out and find the people who had the soft skills and train them to have the hard skills to go with it, which I found absolutely mind blowing for a while. Yeah. You know, it's, it's absolutely true. And a lot of times what we hear with employers we work with, they will take someone with a good attitude, ability to communicate and some of these soft skills way over someone who might have more um, the technical abilities, because just like you said, we can train people, right? People can generally learn some of the technical things. Now, maybe not real specialized, you know, maybe that takes more advanced learning, but Mm -hmm. generally you can train people, but you can't train somebody, you know, as a rule, you know, to, to come and be pleasant or have a good attitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, the hope is we all can learn. Right. But, but, some of these things you have this and you have to, or you have to work on it. And yeah. The curriculum for hard skills like coding and engineering is much easier to train than the, the curriculum for soft skills like public speaking and presentations and just being a pleasant person to be around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've already touched on this a little bit, but why should we even care about public speaking, communications, presentations? Why should the average person really care about this? Well, I think it's, 
you know, in everything we do, even if you aren't going to be a public speaker, just the ability to communicate your thoughts, your ideas, the ability to listen to people. It's so important. I think it's um, one of the stats. It's 90% of um, our interactions are uh, uh, happens one-to-one. So even in those conversations that we have with individuals like it's important that we have those basic listening skills and 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 we might say well you know how hard is it but you know a lot of us i would say you know this is a work in progress learning to actually listen and not just waiting till we can share our thoughts or our ideas things like that Mm -hmm. i absolutely agree there i feel Mm -hmm. like a large majority of people they don't listen they sit they hear But what they're really doing is they're waiting to respond to something. They hear something that you say and they think, oh, I have a really quippy response to that, that I can't wait for them to stop talking so I can respond to this thing. It's so true. And if you truly listen, we're just focused on that person and we're not worried about our response or what we're going to say because we can say that later you know it's it for truly listening it's not about us it's about the other person what are they saying what what do we hear what questions do we have for them you know not sometimes you even get uh where people say well i'm just trying to relate to them but you know we always ask when we're teaching these classes well how does relating to them help them because you know you might be in a conversation somebody like i've done that too well i'm well you're not really listening now you're making it about you (laughs) so Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you touched on this a little bit, but I think an interesting aspect of this is that a large majority of public speaking communication is done one to one. And when we think about some of our most important relationships in our lives, oftentimes we think of friends and partners. Those are all one to one relationships and being able to articulate yourself, to present ideas that you have, to represent those things in a way that people can understand. That's public speaking. That's communication. If you aren't able to do that, you're perhaps missing out on some of the best relationships you could have in your life. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's that, the side to even, you know, we, we talk about the presenting, but the same rules or, or, um, principles, right. Apply to these one-to-one conversations. So I think about that, just some, you know, communication components, and you probably heard that before, but, um, the makeup of that only, our words are responsible for like 7% of what's believed. The rest, it's like our tone, that's 38%. And then our body language, 55%. So if I say like, oh yeah, I really wanna hear what you're saying, but you know, I'm on my phone or I'm distracted. Well, our body language is definitely saying, you know, something something different, so. Mm -hmm. Communication is such a nuanced topic. It's amazing how, it's amazing how little our words, well, How do I phrase this properly? It's amazing how much and yet how little our words impact what what we're doing. I remember the the quote that's said often is that it doesn't matter what you say, it's how you say it. You can you can give someone the worst news possible, but if you do it in the right way, they will receive it much much better than if you were to come out straight and say uh, the company's lost fifty percent profits in the last week. You could probably dress it up a little bit they're still not going to be happy with the results, but they might receive it better than if you just come out straight and say that, we'll say the bad news. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we can see this in customer service a lot. And I think across industries, it spans, you know, you have a disgruntled customer or client. Uh, you hear this all the time. Maybe they they get on the phone and they're, they're fussing and, um, you know, if, if you have, if you have a strong communicator on the other side of that phone, you know, let, let's just use the example, like the billing is wrong and somebody's really upset because they've called, I've called, you know, I've called twice and this is wrong. You know, you can have somebody who has no, none of those skills that escalate the issue, right? And it gets worse and worse and it's heated. Or you can have somebody that right away just calms it down and say, you know what, what I hear is you're really upset and let me see how I can help you with this. You know, it's really hard for people to stay heated and in that state if you, are, are calm and you show that you're listening and that you're in tune with them. So mm-hmm. I absolutely agree with you there. So we've touched a lot on some of the benefits of like, mm-hmm. being a good communicator and public speaker. So just a quick layout of some of the things I want to talk about yeah. next for a little bit. I'd like to just talk a bit about some of the skills or traits 
expected or unexpected that have helped you develop your public speaking skills, then maybe go the other way and see how public speaking has helped outside of that. Then after that, maybe go a bit more into the like the breakdown of communication of how we can improve bit by bit. Does that sound good with you? Yeah. Okay. So starting off, what are what were some of the skills or traits, either expected or unexpected, that helped you as you've been developing your skills of public speaking, presentation, and communication? I think the one of the things is just getting over ourselves, right? We can make it so much about ourselves, like, oh my gosh, what are they going to think? Oh my, what what if I fail? What if I, well, it, mindset is 100% of the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, if you, we've heard it before, right? If someone says, oh, I hope I don't fall. Well, a lot of times they're going to fall because they put that in their head. So in my mind, a huge part of communication presenting is, is what you're saying to yourself and your mindset. So if I wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to do a great presentation today and I'm going to speak this group and I, it's, it's a gift and they're going to receive it well. I know that, you know, now here's the thing you can't, we had a mentor that said never, ever, um, when, when you're presenting, you have to have done your work, right? If you're presenting or, or speaking, you don't just get up and say something positive. You have, you have to put in the work. And, and that's many, many hours. I mean, some presentations you might spend 40 hours on, you know, before you're delivering a 45 minute talk or something like that. So you have to do the work. But once you've done the work, then you have to get out of your head. And I think it, it's building up your confidence. Um, time and reps, right? It's like the gym. Time and reps, the more you do it, the better, mm-hmm. the easier it gets. Certainly. There's something in there that you said that, that struck me. It reminded me of an interesting quote. I don't remember who said it. That's one thing about quotes I'm really bad at. I remember <laughs> the quote, but I'm bad at remembering who said it. Uh, the quote's something along the lines of, we wouldn't worry about what other people thought about us if we, rel- if we realized how seldom they do. Del- delving into that, it's essentially saying that if we realize how little people actually think about us and what we're doing, because they're busy thinking about, oh, what does everyone think about ourselves? That we might realize, oh, wait a second, this probably isn't as big a deal as I'm making it out to be. It's so true. I, I've also heard that quote, um, what other people think about you is none of your business. Mm-hmm. And if you kind of adapt that, you know, philosophy, things go better. You know, if you're if you're, um, you know, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but you know, if you have something and you're going to present, the best way is like just to realize it's not about you. I think that was another thing I learned with our training with John Maxwell, um, the team. It's, you know, that's one of the things uh, John Maxwell shared with us. He's our mentor, and he had shared, it's not about you. And I think so much we make it about us, like, oh, how do I sound? How do I look? What are they going to think of me? And if we can just set that aside you know i kind of call that like that's a rookie mindset and that's fine right we're it's a process if we start the process and that's where we're at okay that's fine but just don't stay there we have to like step it up and realize like you said it's not people don't really care it's not about us and another um thing i remember a friend sharing um you know when we started and i I would be sometimes nervous groups we were going to speak to nikki think of it like you're giving the audience a gift so you know, you've done the preparation, you've done the hard work, you have your presentation down, and now you just have to give it. And if you go in with that mindset that I'm giving a gift, that's way better than like, oh, I hope this is like X, Y, or Z. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. The mindset going into giving presentation or just talking to someone about maybe an important topic can make all the difference in the world. So going from this uh, what skills can help you as a public speaker? What about going the other way around? How is maybe public speaking or communication, how is improving those skills helped you perhaps in some unexpected ways off stage? I think, you know, confidence. When you start being able to articulate messages and you get less and less fearful, it gives you confidence in other areas of life. Um, probably the ability ability to just impromptu be able to speak on different things or speak up and um, say your thoughts in different things like meetings or um, whatever that might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's an interesting thing going on as, as I've been interviewing a lot of different people from different, different subjects, different topics. 
uh, lately I've done this past like these past few weeks I've done like maybe three four ish interviews and all of them on wildly different topics one about relationships one on leadership one on martial arts and now talking with you today about communication and public speaking and every single time one of the like one of the outcomes or one of the unexpected outcomes that people had from developing whatever skill it is they're doing is confidence in other areas of their lives. And I find that so interesting that confidence and competence in one area always seems to bleed over in some way into other areas of your life, even if it doesn't interact with it in any other way. Just, I thought that's an, that's a really interesting thing that happens. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And, um, I think the very first thing that starts with is, is our self-awareness, right? Like how, how are we showing up or how are we, um, thinking about things? I, I still always go back to, um, you know, our mindset. So the confidence is built through speaking, but you're right. It, it, it gives us, um, as we do it more and more, it does, you know, uh, it does bridge over to these other areas. And I think that's, that's a part of, you know, if you have a growth mindset, you're continually working on yourself and improving. And some of those things come up, you know, if in public speaking, it might not just be, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think like, like there might be personal things that come up. They're like, Oh, I didn't even realize like this. So, you know, you have the choice. Are you going to walk through that and deal with the little thing that could hold you back? Or are you going to, just brush it over. You know, I always say this, it's way better to deal with the things like coach yourself. Why, wait, why am I feeling this? Like, Oh, well, why, you mm -hmm. know, what, are, what is this about? What's the root here? So I think it's, it's maybe not just the speaking, but it's the work you do, um, you know, to, to get that, uh, confidence in speaking. And that leads to sometimes those benefits in other areas. So. Mm -hmm. Speaking about that, the work you do to build confidence in speaking. Let's break down communication a bit to its fundamental pieces and try to tackle it bit by bit. So in preparation for this episode, I try to make like a I try to make a list of categories of different aspects of speaking that came to mind for me. Where I thought, yeah, this is something that I think people would probably want to learn about or want to look at to try to improve their speaking. So list I the list I came up with was the before, well, before speaking, during, and after, and then the mental aspect, the physical aspect, and maybe the technological aspect. And we've already had fun talking about the technological aspect before we started this. I've had internet problems all of yesterday, and trying to get this yeah. working was so fun. <laughs> but sort of. Yeah. Do you want to? Um, so, do you want to talk about? You, you'll just have to remind me, and we'll break it down as we go. So, before speaking, kind of the prep work. Yeah. Let's. What What goes into making a speech or a presentation or just before we get into a communication situation, what can we do to prepare for it? Yeah, I think whatever topic you choose, you want to make sure you've gathered the information, right? You've done the research, you you feel like you've um, put the time and work into it. You know, you're not just uh, putting something, you know, asking chat GPT, not that, not that that can't help you get started, but you've done the work, right? You've looked at the different aspects of this topic. You are passionate about um, the topic and what you want to deliver. And that's kind of the first part. I kind of, I kind of think it like it in school, like you're right, you're writing this big messy draft, right? And all the things you're thinking go, go to, at least for me, you know, people are different. I know my husband does it a little bit differently. He's more of a process person. So, but for me, it's a creative process. So there's a lot of things, you know, there might be books and quotes that I'm, and I'm working it through in my head too. And so it's a, it's that big picture. And then slowly, you know, you start to narrow it down. It's actually harder. Um, it's actually harder to do a shorter talk because you have to think, what is the outcome I want? And what are the, what is the, the impact I'm looking to have? So if you have a 15 or 20 minute speech, to me, that is way harder. And I think most speakers will tell you than like an hour speech, you have a lot more liberty to, to speak and talk. And the other thing is, you know, rookie, rookie things when people are starting out, you've probably seen it. They'll have 20 minutes and they give you 10 points. It's like, no, don't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, you know, our brains can only absorb so much. So we get so excited 
Um, and, and I did this. I, my husband helped me with this because he's more that process guy. So um, I'd have all this like, isn't this great? Like, I'm going to give them these seven points. Say, Nikki, it's 30 minutes. No, we're not going to do that to that. We're giving them three points. And, and, you know, a few reasons for that. Our brains like three. People can only process so much information. So we think it's great, right? We're going to give them all the points and the sub points under that. But the reality is they're not going to remember it. So I always go back to when I'm starting kind of that before speaking, okay, what do I want the outcome to be? And what are, what are my main points? And sometimes you may not know that till you go through all of that information, you know, it's a mm -hmm. process. <laughs> Absolutely. You hit a, like in that short, like maybe two, three minute spiel you just gave, you hit an absolute gold mine of information that I want to touch on. So okay. One, I've, so I've trial and errored my way through my process to try to uh, create th these podcast episodes. And everything you just talked about is basically what I landed on of where do I start with? Uh, like, what am I going to start with? For a while, I started with what's the topic I want to talk about. But now I start more with what's the outcome I want to get for the audience. For example, the outcome of today's episode that I'm hoping for is that people will feel more confident about going out and trying public speaking, and they'll have some sort of path or some sort of information that they can use to go and improve their communication skills. And with that very, like, with that specific outcome in mind, I've been able to try to craft certain questions and keep things in mind to say, does this contribute towards that desired outcome? And it's been absolutely helpful. And... Another aspect that you touched on was it's harder to give a shorter speech than a longer speech. And when you said that, I was instantly reminded of another quote. I think this is an Ernest Hemingway quote, but I could be very wrong on that, where uh, he said, sorry, I uh, sorry I wrote you a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one, where people will often, it's far much easier to create a long piece of content that's more rambly, that's more like that goes on tangents here and there. And not to say that that's bad. But when you have a short amount of time, you have to really distill the information that you give to, to be able to fit the time allowed and to distill it in such a way that people can still derive value from it. I agree. I agree um, with that. And here's the thing. The, I remember uh, our, our mentor, John Maxwell, saying this too, and it, it's so great. You know what? When you first start public speaking, you're going to stink. <laughs> it's okay. Get over it mm -hmm. because you have nowhere to go but up. So I think that's really helpful too. Like you're not going to be perfect the first time you do it or even the second or third time. You're going to have some aspects that are really great, you know, and others, the way you do it, as with anything, it's that practice. You keep doing it. You keep practicing. You keep honing your skill. as It's a skill as with anything else. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I think one of the best gifts you can give someone is to let them be a beginner at something because there's nothing quite as satisfying as either being the beginner who grows really fast or watching a beginner take their first steps in learning a new skill because you can see them grow so fast from, hey, like your first one sucked, but here's one or two things you can do to improve drastically for the next time. And then they try those one or two things and you can really see that 80-20 rule coming into play early on with a beginner where they suck at everything up front, but then you give them that small little bit of, okay, we're going to focus on improving this aspect first, and then they go again, and they do much better. Awesome. Let's give you another piece of feedback that you can improve on. And just watching a beginner go from absolutely nothing to, hey, you're actually pretty good or proficient at this thing. It's it's amazing. Yes, absolutely. I think um, being able to see that and for other people to, you know, call out what the, what the, what the person is doing well and areas for improvement. That's a great, that's a great gift. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a bit about the preparation phase of going into either giving a presentation, giving a talk or whatever you want to call it. What about during the actual presentation part? What, what might be going on there? Well, well, during, I, you know, and I'll just start at the very basics. When you're going to give a presentation um, for a group, um, some of this might seem very basic, but to me, I think not everyone always realizes it. So I'm going to just say, you know, very first thing, you're speaking to a group, you want to show up early. You want to show up 
you know, at least I, I always, at least an hour early, right? You want to get your tech down. You want to make sure our goal is always when we're presenting, everything is set up and done. So even if, even if you're 30 minutes early, when people walk in that door, that's a big part of your presentation, first impression. So, you know, where you can be at that door or, you know, circling around the group, good morning, how are you? I'm so glad that you're here. That is kind of the first impression, you know, a lot of times uh, what you'll see is people still fidgeting, you know, at 10 to with their, with their tech or they're distracted in their own thing. You want to be like where you have this down, you've practiced it, you know it, your tech's all set and great. Now I can relax why people come in. And that's like the ultimate, if you can, you know, when you go to present, um, you know, basics, once again, you know, you, you look professional depending on, you know, sometimes you can be more casual, but generally, you know, uh, you want to be professional, even, even if it is a more casual environment for the participants, you are the professional. So I think you want to, you know, you're the speaker, you're the expert they're coming to hear. So, uh, dress the part and be professional. And, um, yeah, I don't know anything else you want to know there. I want to dig a bit more into this idea of first impressions because as the saying goes, you can only make a first impression once. What are some mm -hmm. things that go into making a good first impression? Perhaps not just even the field of public speaking communications, but perhaps just overall in general. How can we work on improving our first impressions? Yeah, I think when we're going into settings, it's kind of that same question, right? Maybe you're going to a networking event and, um, you know, we there's different ways we can show up. We can kind of be the person who just kind of sits back and waits for people to come to us and nothing wrong with that. Right. But, but I think deciding it's a great question you can ask yourself in a lot of instances, what do I want the outcome from this to be? So my first impression, if I'm going somewhere or I want to meet somebody, we want to be, you know, professional looking, we want to have, you know, maybe we have some, like in a network setting, we have some questions that we have kind of memorized that we, we can ask. People generally in those situations love to talk about themselves. So if you have a few good curated questions to ask people, right, you can kind of just sit back and enjoy listening if you're more introverted and you don't really like um, doing that or talking, but you know you need to get out there and do some of this for your job. Just being that little, I think my biggest thing would be like preparation. So, you know, thinking about what you want to achieve, what you want the outcome to be, how do you need to show up? And, and that, once again, we talked about it, but it goes back to mindset, right? Really getting your mindset right in that too, because you can have very different outcomes based on how you show up. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely the person who shows up at a networking event and stays in the back corner, not knowing what to do. But definitely I can see more of the value of going in with an intention in mind. I know personally, when I'm thinking about first impressions, the first thing that comes to mind is, how do I dress? How do I look? And what's something I can wear? What's something I can do so that I can be remembered? Because if everyone's showing up, let's go with a standard networking event, for example, where everyone's showing up in a like suit and tie sort of like fancy, more formal event. If I show up as with a normal plain suit and tie, no one's going to remember who I am because they're going to see me as just another face that just sort of blends into the crowd. But if I show up with, I don't know, part of my aesthetic when I want to stand out or that I just kind of like is I'm not a big tie guy, but I, much, I very much like ascots. So people remember, oh yeah, you're the guy with the ascot. You stood out a little bit and you stick into someone's mind. Or you go in with some sort of intention to say, I want to learn this thing or I want people to see me as this kind of person. And when you have that intention going into it, it's much easier to craft an experience for yourself and for others to say, this is the kind of person they're going to interact with. This is the kind of person I'm going to show up as. That's going to drastically change what kind of first impression you have, where most people might not even consider what first impression they're giving off in whatever setting, whether that be like on dating profiles, where whatever pictures you put up, that's your first impression. Or if that's, you're going to a networking yeah. event, it's everything is on first impressions. People make a decision about what they think of you within like a quarter of a second upon seeing you for the first time. So it's amazing what a little bit of prep work can do when you try to make a good first impression with someone. Absolutely. And it's that once again, goes back to just a little preparation. And I like that idea you spoke of kind of creating the vision, right? We can have 
maybe we have this bigger vision for our life or our career, or whatever, but it's, it's that little, like, what is my vision for this event or what, what do I want to happen or, you know, uh, what do I want this outcome to be? So I think that's a great, a great reminder. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of an idea of we spend so much time thinking about what car am I going to drive? What house am I going to buy? And yet we don't invest nearly that same amount of time into deciding what kind of life do I want to live? What kind of interactions do I want to have? So it's taking that same idea of what, like the prep work that you go into buying a car or buying a house or making a big life decision and just sort of scattering that out, that throughout other aspects of your life. So yeah, yes. it's, it's interesting, but <laughs> it is. <laughs> so beyond just the during aspect of I guess, beyond going on what's happening during your public speaking and presentations, what about afterwards? Should we worry about what happens afterwards? Does that something we have to even care about? Or is it just one done, move on to the next thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it, it's like kind of the whole package, right? If it's well done, you know, maybe there's some follow up afterwards. Maybe there's a link that they'll go to your page or a further interaction. Maybe there's something you want to want them to do. So thinking about that, sometimes we get um, and I know this is an area where uh, for a while people would be like, so what's the next stop? And we'd spend so long in the presentations like, oh, shoot, we don't, we have it, but we didn't articulate that. So having next steps for people for that after, you know, um, after speaking is really, uh, really important. And once again, if you're new to speaking, okay, your big thing is focus on the presentation, you know, then, then you can add this, you know, what to do after. But I think uh, a follow-up email, if you can do that is always nice. Hey, thank you so much for coming. By the way, here's a few links with uh, helpful things that you might uh, find useful. So having some things like that, to where you can stay in contact, if that's, you know, your, your goal to stay in contact with your audience or have some uh, something valuable that you're sharing with them after that's a, that's a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. Having a call to action at the end is almost the purpose of the presentation itself, where if you give the whole presentation, it's wonderful, it's glamorous, and at the end you leave your audience hanging. It's almost like saying, awesome, you came for the opening act, and then you kind of missed the main show. That, that, that is so true, and I think that's a really important aspect. What is the call to action? Maybe it's simply like connect with me on social media or uh, sign up for my email, list. whatever that is. I think it's very important to have that call to action. What do you want the audience to do? And often, like I said, we get so wrapped up in the presenting, we forget like, oh, oh what is the next step? But a well-seasoned speaker will have that next step for people and the call to action, whatever it is. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, sometimes it does entail you know, selling like, Hey, here's our program, or here's the, you know, next logical step for you. If you want to continue to work on X, Y, or Z, but you know, sometimes it, it looks different. So, but, but, and having that call to action is important. Mm -hmm. And this goes beyond just a business aspect where sure we talk about public speaking often a business aspect because that's where it's mostly used. But in those one-on-one -on -one -on -one conversations with people, in those one-on-one -on -one interactions, another example of that might be, what's the desired call to action for your dating profile? It's that people swipe on you and want to go on a date with you. That's another kind of call to action or another kind of desired outcome that you want to have happen afterwards. So this applies even outside of the world of business and business presentations. But digging into another aspect of the after, well, the after portion what about reflecting and reviewing? How might we want to look at that in terms of looking at our uh, communication skills and our uh, public public speaking abilities? Yeah, I think it's important. Well, you can get feedback. Um, Sometimes now they have some electronic things that you can set up to where you could pull the audience. Like, did you find this useful? Where's one thing? What's one thing that could be improved? We generally, when we go in, um, if it's a workshop we'll give a feedback form at the end because it's a, it's about that continuous improvement. What did you really like? Um, what Where would you like to see improvement? What would make this a 10 if you didn't rate it a ton? Now, one thing to note there, you know, I always laugh, certain styles will never give a 10. They'll say, oh, well, 10, it'd have to be perfect. So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know, that, at first in the beginning, I was 
would get frustrated by that. Like, well, you, you gave this an eight or nine, but you don't say how to improve it. But you just, this is where as a speaker, you look at the other, okay, 90% gave it, you know, a nine or 10. Okay, it's, it's, that's pretty darn good. And, and take some of those comments that might be the outliers. And I'm not gonna change my whole speech based on one or two things. Now, if it's valid, yeah, you know, that was a good, X, Y, or Z was a good point, then, then we're gonna use that. But I tell you, that has helped us to create um, more impactful talks and more impactful things based on what people have shared because we all need different things, right? We, we, um, we teach a lot with the DISC model of human behavior and people think of that in terms of everyday, you know, personality and things that energize us in the workplace, but it, it's also relevant. I, I didn't really touch on that, but that is really relevant in your presenting too. So different styles, like if you want to engage all of the styles, you need some different things. So we can go over that if you want to, or keep moving, you, you know, you tell me. Yeah, we can touch on, uh, touch on disc in a second, but first yeah. there's one more question related to the reflecting aspect that I wanted to touch on. And uh, I'm reminded of many professional sports players, stars, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they often review the game tape or they'll go back and watch their performance on something. Is that something that we should consider doing with public speaking as well? Or what might that look like with public speaking? You know, I think that's great if you, you know, can go back and um, see yourself and listen and, and count the good too, right? Because too often we can see all the, oh, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. I think like making sure you're giving yourself also some things that you can celebrate, like, oh, I did great, I stayed on time. Um, the audience was engaged, you know, those are important things. So celebrating the good, but also, you know, looking at, yeah, objectively shoot. I, I guess I really stayed, you know, behind the podium where I could have been out with my audience. These are ways that you see, or sometimes we may not see those things. So asking someone else who's a trusted mentor or professional or coach, asking them for some, Hey, could you give me some feedback on this? And then, you know, being open, I think if we're teachable, that's how we continue to improve. Mm -hmm. I always like the what went well, what could improve. <laughs> Absolutely. Celebrate the wins and point out, we'll point out the losses to say, this is what I'm going to work on next time. But don't forget to celebrate those wins because yes. if we keep on beating ourselves down of, oh, you didn't do perfect at this thing, you're not going to improve that way. But just really enjoy the process. Enjoy being yeah. a beginner. Take it with, we'll take it with stride and know that even the best public speakers in the world they look up, well, they watch their own game, ta game tape and they say, I could do better at this. I can do better at that. They probably also celebrate their wins and say, I did really good at this thing. I tried to do good, better at it. So, yeah. Yes. So you did touch on this idea of DISC. What is, what is DISC? Um, you know, DISC uh, is the, it's a human behavioral model and it's really about, it's a personality uh, assessment, but it's really about people sometimes get a little like, oh, what, what does this mean? It's really, DISC is a measure of what energizes us. So um, I won't go all completely into it, but the different styles, you know, it's something to think about when we're presenting. Because have you ever walked away from, I, I'll give the example, during the pandemic, I was onto a talk and I just thought it was great. I was really jazzed up like, oh my gosh, I'm so inspired. And I got off and my husband had happened to be in the room too. And I said, wasn't that great? And he's like, he said a whole lot of nothing. It was like fluff. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so, but he's a completely different style. So what, you know, energizes me, inspires me is different than him. So, you know, just, just really easy um, points are, are D or dominant style. They're gonna want more bullet points and results oriented visuals. So show me how to get to the goal or, you know, what's the point here? Why should I listen? That's important. Our eye style are inspiring. Make things fun. So if you can engage the audience a little bit, have some maybe videos that are fun, things like that. That's great. Um, our S or supportive style. They like if you create just a good feeling about information. So like if it's team or family, kind of more that people aspect of things. And then our C, this is probably like the hardest group, um, you know, to engage because they're, they're checking it out and saying, how can I trust you? Is this factual? Is this right? And whether you want to believe it or not, they're doing this. So mm -hmm. making sure that you have facts and data is also Im important. 
and also that it's spelled out in a logical way. So it's not like, you know, for C style, it would be like, I, I can't follow this. <laughs> so, so this is why it's great friends with different style or your mentor to kind of run it through some of that. Like, Hey, am I hitting on all of these important things? So just some little nuggets there. Mm -hmm. That definitely sounds like something that would be good to throw into the, like preparing for a talk yes. where you're digging into who's the audience, what kind of people are they going to be? Are you going to be talking to a bunch of like uh, hyper extroverted college frat bros? Or are you going to be talking to a room full of like quiet tech nerds and knowing your audience and what kind of person they're going to be? Probably the quiet tech nerd is going to care a lot more about the like the data behind it the can i trust you with what you're saying like do you have verifiable sources versus the like the partying frat bro who might care more about what's the vibe that you give off what's the inspiring message and yeah it's going to vary very much from based on whatever whatever audience you're going for and you're probably not going to yes. hit everyone but yeah. having a target audience in mind that'll help so much Absolutely. We didn't really talk about that, but that, that is really the number one thing we kind of, that's okay. I always think it's okay. It can flow, right? Um, yeah. We can touch back on it now. Yeah. Um, to me, that is really the number one thing, right? For prepping is who is my audience? That is so important. You know, where you can, like if it's smaller groups, you're talking at a chamber event or something like that. I always get the um, names and it's not to be nosy or it matters, who's, but it, it matters different positions different, you know, I'm looking at that and saying, okay, what are some examples that are relevant? You know, sometimes you can't do that. If you have a group of 200, mm -hmm. okay, you're going to probably know, here's the different businesses that are there and you get an idea, but you are so right. If I'm talking to a group of engineers, I, I'm still going to bring my style, which is fun and inspiring, right? But I'm going to probably make sure I am a little bit more subdued and, uh, you know, otherwise they, they might think you're, you're flighty or something like that. So I'm going to be a little more subdued and probably a little more serious. I'm going to have a lot of those facts, just like you said. So it, it really does matter because like you said, that credibility, people are, are seeing if they can connect with you. And if you've kind of checked off some of these things. Mm -hmm. People like talking to people, not perf not perfect entities of information and knowledge. And by having some, flaws or by having some something that lets people know, yeah, I am a person who is presenting this information to you in a way that I think will connect best with you. That'll help them so much more than just here is my information and accept yeah. it, take it how you will. And like you mentioned, you're going to tailor your presentation for your audience. You might have like one presentation, but you alter it a little bit based on where you're giving it, where you're probably not going to be jumping up and down and having group activities with your engineers, you might do that with like, uh, I don't know, maybe a HR team who's very, like, very feeling and very wanting to be in the action with people. Yes, yep, yep, absolutely. You know, you really have to, um, well, people, I don't think people expect perfection. But it's like, you know, you, you did your best job, and you're real. And the other point to this is, um, you know, don't underestimate the importance of stories. Like we can all share information that we are passionate about, but just, if I just get, get up there and give you, um, you know, three bullets or, you know, here's seven tips if I have an hour or two of this, but I, I just give you information. That's not really fun. Our brains are wired for um, those human stories, the human elements we want to, that's how we remember. So mm -hmm. once you have your, that's kind of the honing process, right? Goes back to our, I'm probably throw, throwing it off. We're going all over here, but that's okay. You know, in that, in that um, creation of things, I'm going back then and I'm adding like, great, I have the good bones and now I'm adding the stories, the human elements, because that is who we are. We, we want to hear those things that impact us and the stories related to the information. That's what people remember the stories. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Stories is how we transmitted information for hundreds or thousands of years before we had like real lit written language where even today we, there's something about sitting around a campfire and telling stories with people. It doesn't have to be scary stories, but just telling <laughs> stories with people, something about that experience is so memorable and so so different and we can get a similar effect to that by telling stories on stage or with people and when you look at even one-to-one -one conversation most of the time it's 
tell me about what you're doing. Awesome. I have a story related to that. I want to share this story. And oh, they have a story related to that. They want to share that story. Life in all communications is basically just a transmission of stories on stories on stories. And yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah. fun. So definitely start learning your stories. Look out, look throughout your life and see what are my stories that I have? Because trust me, even the most boring person has stories. Yes, it's true. And that really brings the presentation alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we talked a lot about the before, during, and after. Maybe not always in that order, but certainly I feel like people have gotten a good gist of what are some like before, during, and after things that we can do to improve our improve our speeches, improve our communication. Next, we want to touch a bit more into some of the different aspects, such as the mental, the physical, and the technological side of things. So first, mental. What are some things we can do mentally to maybe try to prepare ourselves more to be better public speakers or better communicators? I think always working on our mindset, right? That's it. To me, this is a daily thing. Um, renewing your thoughts, renewing your mind. What am I thinking? What am I watching? Um, what what am I putting into my, my my thoughts, right? Because those things are going to come out. So I think um, really understanding the importance of what we are thinking, you know, our thoughts align with our emotions to create the results we're getting, whether if we're not getting the results we want, we need to go back and look at those things. You know, one of the quotes we use in training, it's until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. That's a Carl Jung quote, but, but it's, it goes back to that. If, if something comes up and I feel a resistance, am I going to walk through that? Am I going to dig down? Like, what is this mindset? Am I going to challenge that mindset that isn't serving me or that's holding me back or saying I can't do something? So to me, to me, I love it. It's like an adventure, like, okay, what are we going to, what are we going to challenge this week or, or today? It's, it's, it's fun, but it can take practice and not always easy. Mm -hmm. Definitely your informational diet of what information do you put into your head? It's something that most people don't consider. They're much more happy to consider what food am I going to put into my body? And yet we don't even think about what kind of information we put into our heads. Is it uplifting information? Do I feel better after watching this series of YouTube videos? Do I feel better after scrolling TikTok for who knows how long? And yet... Yeah. We don't care about that nearly as much as we care about what sort of food we put in our body, even though debatably the information we put into our heads will have a much larger impact on our lives. So what about the aspects of like overcoming that fear of public speaking? Since as we mentioned earlier, public speaking is the number one fear of, I'm pretty sure it's at least most Americans, if not of almost everyone in the world, even more so than death. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes you can do this on your own through the practice and time and reps and speaking speaking things to yourself until you start to believe it. I always, one of the exercises we do sometimes in coaching, it's like, okay, what are the lies I'm believing? Okay, you list them out. And then, okay, what's the actual truth or the inverse of those? And so we list those out. And, and the, the whole thing um, is to start speaking the truth or the uh, thing we know is actually the reality, right? Or, or um, yeah, I'll just say the truth of the situation. So we speak that until we believe it. So that's important. If you absolutely can't, you know, get over that, I think it's great hire a coach or maybe you have to do some counseling, right? There's no shame in that. I think everyone can benefit from those professionals in their lives to help them overcome some of those things. If it's, if it's just a, a sticking point where that they, they can't get over that. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Professionals exist for a reason. Yeah. So what about more of the, like, the physical aspect of giving a presentation? That could be everything from like attire, from like physical health impacting like your public speaking ability. Perhaps it's body language or just there's a whole lot that goes under that category of physical when I think about public speaking. So let's it'll probably take a bit to go over some of this stuff. But what are some of your yeah. thoughts on it? Yeah, I think there's different offshoots, just like you said, you know, number one would be um, how I'm showing up, right? If I uh, am, am unkempt and uh, my hair is a mess and right, that doesn't portray that great first impression. So I, I just always say we want to be professional, whatever is appropriate for where we're speaking and, and knowing your audience, right? Uh, dress appropriately. So that's, you know, number one. Um, 
another thing I think don't underestimate, like getting good rest. When you are going to speak, you don't want to be like, oh yeah, I was up till 1 a.m. and up at five. You are not going to give your best talk. So Mm -hmm. all of this to me, it's like discipline, but you're getting a good night's sleep. You're fueling your body. You're you know, making sure you're properly hydrated. These things can seem maybe silly, but but they're so important. Like if you don't have good rest, you are probably not going to have the faculties to actually pull off your talk and to speak in a coherent manner, right? Because you're going to be tired. Absolutely. Don't treat communication and public speaking like you're a college student rushing at the last minute to finish an assignment. You don't want to be up at 1 a.m. writing the last bits of your speech unless you had a sudden breakthrough and for some reason you have to change it last minute but even then maybe maybe hold off on that and save it for another time but yeah our mentor you know used to share that like like it's absolutely unexcusable to show up unprepared if people are coming to see you you better have done your work you know like just do the work and and make sure that you're prepared. Like you said, sometimes things happen last minute and you have to tweak something. That's fine. But you know, you don't wait. You're giving you a 60 minute talk for a hundred people and you're writing it the night before. That's not cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. So more of a personal question for me, but I know it's a question that a lot of people also have. And it's a question about like hearing one's own voice and the quality of one's own voice. So, for example, I want to improve the quality of my voice. It's not that I necessarily dislike it, but I know I can make it sound better or more pleasing to the ear. Do you have any like, advice on exercises, tools, or tactics, or something that people could use to perhaps prepare their voice for a better like listening experience for, for the audience? Yeah, there are. Um, I know when we've done... Um like uh, on worship teams and things like that, there are actually uh, exercises and you'd have to Google it. I don't have that exact resource right now, but there are actually like exercises to warm up your voice and things like that. And if you are like speaking ongoing, your voice can get tired. So the hydration is really important. You know, if you are someone who, you know, maybe get some of that squeakiness or whatever, maybe you have to do some of that little, you know, it's like a scale and you go up and down and um, you could probably Google those like voice exercises to warm up your voice. But the other thing, if you just feel like, Hmm, my voice might be annoying or so, you know, like maybe sometimes these things are just not true. Have someone else listen to you. And if it is something you can always work with a voice coach. I know in, um, broadcast news, we had a lot of like, um, people who would work with voice coaches or talent coaches, however that is. So once again, this just goes back to your um, honing your skills, right? Maybe that's not something you do right off, but when you start getting really good, then you uh, notice some of these nuances and maybe it's like, okay, you know, and in this season, you know, the next little six months, I'm going to work with a voice coach, you know, Mm -hmm. and things like that. Absolutely. When you start getting good at something and you want to treat it more professionally, or you want to perhaps take it to the next level, do what the pros do pros in sports all the time they have coaches for a reason they have like they go back and watch the game tape they review it they yeah they, they do a I lot of prep say, work yeah i would say generally you know we're open to a lot of different styles when people are presenting right because that's who they are you don't have to i think the voice coaching and things like that is more important like if you're going to be a news talent or if you're you know um on air you know broadcasting that might be um something where that is warranted more because generally i think people are more open uh to the different nuances and variances in in how we talk or how we present because that that's what makes us us absolutely so yeah um are there any other aspects of like the physical side of public speaking you think we should go over that's basically covered my list, but I don't know if there's anything else that I'm missing there that you think yeah, this be, think, might be a good one to touch on. Yeah, maybe the last thing would just be like, like watch for little things that are distracting to the audience. One of the things I used to do, it's, it's because if you're on your feet for eight hours, like if we had workshops, I would sometimes cross my feet, you know, and then we'd look back and my hubby's like, Nikki, that's kind of that's kind of distracting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, so what I, you know what, I went and bought the expensive shoes. Now my feet don't hurt, but little things like that, that don't like, I would think like, Oh, no one's really seen, you know, if, if others, and no one ever said anything, but you know, when you start to critique yourself, it's true. I was kind of crossing my legs at, you know, and, and you need to be aware of those things. Cause these are things that will, um, uh, distract your audience. So I think being aware, if you have like little nervous tics or things like that, okay, what do you need to do to kind of calm yourself down? Or, 
you know, prepare yourself or just, just to be aware or to minimize the, the things. Mm -hmm. I can picture it now a, uh, a Nikki totem pole standing in the middle of stage, legs crossed, just waving your arms around, trying to explain your thing. It's an interesting <laughs> image. But... I don't know that it was even really noticeable. I would just, <laughs> when I got really t like right at the ankles, just kind of the legs because I was like stretching but you know mm -hmm. it's true so yeah get the good shoes or whatever you need and now that doesn't happen anymore <laughs> <laughs> okay so I know we touched on this briefly but what about the technology side of public speaking and presentations to PowerPoint or not to PowerPoint that is always the question <laughs> you know it, that can be a preference I think I think if you're giving a lot of information what I find people will be distracted because they will feel, they'll, and they'll stop you. I, I, you know, before we usually do a PowerPoint, but sometimes even the PowerPoint, like, wait, can you, it's always amazing to me. And it doesn't happen so much anymore. But in the beginning, you know, like, can you go back? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, people often flip those fast. You know, I've been in co conferences, you're taking notes seriously and they flip them. And I'm, I guess that's, a, that's a great tip just there on that make sure you do have your slides up long enough that people can take notes because that will distract them. If they miss that, then they get, you know, a little frustrated. So make sure your tech is working well. Always, always practice it. If you're going to um, a place, make sure you have a few different ways that you can sign on. Um, I have different things that I do in our business. My husband kind of, you know, does our tech and I, I'm great to, uh, let him do that. But Hey, I know, I know how to, if we need to. So, you know, make sure you have the extra HDMI cord, make sure, you know, like, don't let the morning of be the first time you, they say, Oh, well, our machine is this and you need an adapter. I always call the place we're going to speak at and find out what they have. Mm -hmm. If there's any special needs, make sure that you're bringing those things, um, you know, so you uh, alleviate a lot of headache in the morning. So that's a big deal with tech. Make sure your slides are clear. We don't want 20 bullet points on a slide. You know, if you have to, probably three max uh, on a slide. And um, to PowerPoint or not, like I said, to going back on that, I think if you have a lot of information, if it's like an all day thing or an hour th where you just have a lot that you're going through or, or you want to engage people, you probably want a PowerPoint. But you know, some things I've done, I've also done um, talks where you know, we have a handout and it's more old school. We're just, I did, I did a talk with a friend on uh, mindsets and we had visuals around the room that we used. So one, this goes back to, again, what do I want the outcome to be? Mm -hmm. How do you want the audience to be engaged and in what way am I, I'm going to do it? It's a lot of asking yourself those questions. Can it work just to, you know, we had a mindset thing and there were stations. So there was like, um, I can't remember seven or nine different little um, stations for them and that they would walk around and go to that, that worked. So um, you just have to ask yourself, what, what am I trying to create here? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm reminded of a, uh, a business presentations class I took and I actually interviewed my professor for that a few, I guess when this goes, I'll be a few weeks back from my Valentine's day episode. But one of the things that I remember him talking about was, in a presentation, you don't want the reader to be focusing on the slideshow. Like maybe they'll glance at it to see where are we at currently, what are the main points that we're talking about. But you want to make sure that your slideshow, if you have one, is additive, not subtractive or detractive to your presentation, whatever it might be. And for me, that's mostly amounted to, okay, if I want this presentation or this slideshow to really add to my public speaking endeavors, then I'm just going to cut words all together. And now I, for almost every presentation I do, it's just a bunch of pictures to help either, to either help me figure out, oh yeah, this is what I'm saying here, or to give the audience a good idea of, oh, what's, like, what's this about? There's a picture of, like, a picture of the Spotify logo and, like, a little AI thing there and, like, a random picture of a grandma. What is, like, what is this going to turn into? And it causes intrigue. Whereas if I just had a bunch of bullet points there, they might just be reading the bullet points instead of listening to what I'm saying, which might have more value or might have less value. So it's like, yeah. And that goes back. I think, like you said, what is the presentation? You know, if you're wanting people to be curious and it's more fun and explorative, that is probably perfectly appropriate. A lot of the trainings that we're doing, we're actually teaching. So when you're teaching things, people need those 
those little nuggets or the bullet points. And, and it's also bringing things like you can't assume today, like, and I'm not saying in a 300 person, you know, room, you're not necessarily going to bring that, that some of that is on them to come prepared. But like, if I'm coming to a training, I'm, I'm probably bringing pens because I mean, I have a, I'm also bringing handouts of my slides because there's nothing worse than people like not, it's better if you have it and they don't need it, but because mm-hmm. the way we learn we're different, some people want to see it written and have that physical kind of like handout in front of them. You know, some people just sit there and listen. So have those things that you need to set people up for success. Absolutely. And one other benefit of having like a slideshow at the end is if you want to have a call to action, such as like if your goal is to collect a bunch of people's emails, perhaps to add to your email list, you could have a new call to action be that hey, if you want access to our slideshow, you can get all the slides at the end, just scan the QR code and sign up for our email list and we'll send it out to you. That's not that a, a, like, that's that an option. A perfect, yeah, that is a perfect thing. If you're go, if you're doing more of like um, just a, you, you know, maybe it's a keynote or something like that and it's more fun, you're going to address the audience and it's not like a teaching, right? Like, like we do a lot of workshops. So those are a little different. So if you're going to something that that's a great way to get people's email addresses to be able to follow up with them after like, Hey, I'll send you the slides. Just, you know, put in your email. Those are great, great things. Mm -hmm. So Nicole, as we're starting to wind this down, are there any big topics that you think we may have glossed over or may have missed that you want to come back to and really address? You know, I think we kind of circled back to them um, in the moment. I'm feeling pretty Pretty good, but um, yeah, anything that you're thinking of? Uh, I guess one or two final questions before we really yeah. round it out. Are there any like final recommended resources people could use to practice and improve their public speaking skills? Anything that you might recommend someone go to to say, who says, I want to improve my communication abilities. I want to improve my public speaking. Where can I go? What What am I doing? Yeah, you know, uh, Toastmasters is a great uh, a great uh, thing. We have a lot of those locally. So getting involved in that, you literally can show up each week, uh, practice your speaking. That is great. You know, if you have a topic that you're passionate about, it adds value to others. Um, there are a lot of places that that need speakers. So think about your Rotary, your Kiwanis, things like that. Often you can um, share your ideas there in a relatively um low risk environment to really gain some of your skills. Even think about like church groups or, or um, different different groups that are looking for speakers. That's a great way to kind of get your feet wet in a environment that's a little bit more supportive than, you know, your first, your first speaking in a keynote in front of 250 people, <laughs> you know, so get mm-hmm. your feet wet, practice a little bit with those um, smaller groups and, and hone your skills like that. Um, the, books, as far as books on communication, one that we use a lot, um, Everyone Communicates, Few Connect with John Maxwell. That's great. He also just came out with another one, uh, 16 Laws, uh, I think it's 16, 16 Laws, something like that, or mm-hmm. uh, of communication. You'll be able to find it if you Google that. I think there's something else in the title there, but that's a great one too. So just some um, solid foundations. We, that's what we like, you know, with the things we do, there's always the new and shiny, but what are the principles? What's the foundation? And that's, I think what, what you want to hang your hat on. Absolutely. And then a few personal recommendations. One weird activity that is surprisingly big out here in Utah is for some reason, people like to have what's called PowerPoint nights where everyone goes and creates their own PowerPoint presentation on whatever the hell they want. And then they all come together and present on their PowerPoint presentations. It could be stories on like the worst prom night ever, or like a big history about some like weird Japanese cult somewhere, but it's an opportunity for people to come together to share their ideas and sort of practice public speaking in a more like fun, weird kind of way. So that's one recommendation if you're looking for something to do with friends. And then a couple that of books. That sounds like a lot of fun and what a mm-hmm. great way to hone your skill, right? That's great. Mm-hmm. And then like a, a book recommendation as well for me is The Storytelling Animal. I don't remember where, who wrote that book, but I just, I distinctly remember listening to it and thinking, yes, this is a good book for helping hone someone's speaking abilities or storytelling abilities. So absolutely. Nicole, thank you Thanks. so much for coming on today. For someone who wants to learn more, connect with you or learn more about what you do, where should they go next? 
Yeah, thanks so much for having me again today. It was a lot of fun. Um, if, they, if people want to know more, they can visit our website. It's Metamorphosis CCT, and that just stands for Coaching, Consulting, and Training. So metamorphosiscct.com or on our Facebook page. We'd love you to um, like our page, follow us at, at @meta_cct. All right, wonderful. Uh, once again, Nicole, I appreciate you coming on today. It's been an absolutely enthralling conversation, so thanks. Thanks. If you enjoyed this episode, then please share with a friend you think would like it or share it on social media. It would absolutely mean the world to me and it helps the podcast grow so much. With all that said, thanks for listening. I greatly appreciate it. And I'll talk to you all later. Ciao.